morning, everyone. My name is Susan Pond, and I'm not Hugh Darren White or the uh, Chief Scientist and Engineer of New South Wales. Hugh sends his abject apologies. He was here. I don't know whether you saw him, but he has a meeting with some important uh, parliamentary committee at 8 o'clock, and his item is first on the agenda, as luck would have it. So he sends his sincere apologies. We acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and their elders past, present and future. This is the first of the 2019 New South Wales Science Research Breakfast Seminars. And uh, as you know, presented by the Office of the uh, Chief Scientist and Engineer. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this first breakfast of the year and to uh, appreciate the, uh, the size of the crowd so early. And I think there are a lot of people who travel quite a long distance to be here. Our speaker for the first of the series this year is Laureate Professor Nick Talley, AC, an internationally renowned authority in the field of neurogastroenterology, but he's telling me that he's uh, moving further afield into immunogastroenterology and linking the two fields. So he will tell us about that in his uh, presentation. Nick is what we would call a national treasure, and I don't have time to go through all of his, uh, his accolades. Apart from his breakthroughs in research that he'll tell you about, he is Pro Vice Chancellor of Global Research at the University of Newcastle. He holds the prestigious adjunct professorial appointment at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and continues to hold the academic rank of Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at the Mayo Clinic. He ranks amongst the 400 most highly cited biomedical scientists in the world and in 2017 was Australia's most cited academic by Google Scholar. In 2018, last year, Nick uh, received the uh, New South Wales Premier's Prize for, Scientist, uh, for Science and Engineering, being, uh, being announced as the New South Wales Scientist of the Year, and also last year received the Companion of the Order of Australia, or oh, was it January this year, Nick? Last year. Uh, the Companion of the Order of Australia, AC, for his eminent service to medical research and education. I won't go through all of his other uh, positions that he's uh, held in the past, but thank you, Nick, uh, for coming. His presentation will be uh, pioneering new discoveries in gut health. So welcome, Nick. So ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a, it's a great privilege to be with you this morning. I'm a clinician. I see patients, still see patients, and I'm interested in clinical problems that are potentially solvable. And so my work is focused on that sort of issues, and I guess as a gastroenterologist, um, when I was uh, exposed early on to patients with unexplained gut symptoms, I became remarkably interested in this, and this is the journey I'm gonna take you on, although my focus will be in the last decade or so of some of the work that we've been doing. And let, let, let me be clear, um, uh, some of the work I'll be presenting today is unpublished, I'll mention where that is. So it's new work and you have to take that with a grain of salt because it has to be. Um, a lot of the other work is published and I'll share that with you. I'll try and tell you the story without too much detail because I know this is a very mixed audience, but I hope in the end you'll have some sense that we're we're making progress and we may actually have some real breakthroughs, although we've got a long way to go, that is for sure. Now, let me hope I can get the slides to work. That would be very helpful. So when I um, 
and I'll just go back one. Yeah, that's it. So how did this all begin, this interest in unexplained gut symptoms? And like many things, it's a bit of a personal journey. I had a friend in medical school and she had these syndromes or one of these syndromes. And in fact, no one could work out what was wrong with her. I remember this terribly well. And then, of course, like many things, accidents happened. I went to Royal North Shore Hospital to start a PhD with Doug Piper, who's a very famous peptic ulcer researcher uh, when I started. And uh, we actually applied for an NH and MRC grant and we didn't get it. Typical. Um, but we then decided rather than studying peptic ulcer disease, we'd look at these unexplained stomach symptoms that people have. And the reason these are important is they're highly prevalent. So about one in six Australians have these symptoms. These are really, really prevalent. Some people have minor complaints, just go to the, the chemist and get something over the counter and they're fine. Other people are grossly incapacitated by their syndrome. And when I started work in this, it was all said to be psychological. Even peptic ulcer was said to be psychological. Except that was wrong. Peptic ulcer was not psychological. And when I started my research about a year into my PhD, uh, the work from Marshall and Warren hit the news. I was actually at one of the presentations where Barry Marshall gave his first talk about this controversial topic of a bacteria causing a chronic disease in the gut. And like all paradigm shifts, absolutely no one believed him or them. They didn't. Well, not no one, but many, many didn't. I must say, when I heard the presentation, I thought it was one of the most exciting things I'd ever heard. A new thought in a disease that was unexplained. And the reason I'm telling this story is this idea that uh, microorganisms can lead to chronic disease is something that has become a big theme lately in research yet again. Um, and indeed in the work that we're doing of pivotal importance. And, and, and I also want to say this, I learned other things from this story uh, as well. Um, it was very clear um, that uh, if you have a paradigm shift, no one believes you. So you need to learn that when you're a scientist. And you need to do very good work to prove a hypothesis. And, that's, and that takes time and years and indeed, uh, 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 that's one of the issues also we all face as scientists. But of course, the exciting part about this research is if you treat Helicobacter, you cure peptic ulcer in many cases, and you can prevent gastric cancer in many cases. So when I started in the field, unexplained gut disorders were these chronic distressing disorders, no known cause, thought to be what are called now brain gut disorders, psychological disorders largely, and very difficult to treat. But I'm going to argue today that's not the paradigm. The paradigm is changing and there's good evidence for this change, evidence that uh, we've certainly made major contributions to. And this idea, in fact, that these are, in some cases, true gut pathological conditions, and these can potentially, therefore, be treated. So let me start off with a condition that I began my work in, uh, as the uh, uh, noise behind me continues. Um, let me start off with the condition I worked in, and then I'll take you through the story quickly. So the work we began with was the syndrome of unexplained stomach symptoms, or what's also called uh, dyspepsia, functional dyspepsia. Now, this is very common, as I've said. This is serious in some people. Some people with this condition are unable to eat well. In fact, they lose weight because of the condition. They really are distressed. It's associated not only with gut symptoms, but also extra intestinal complaints, notably anxiety, sometimes depression, fatigue, sleep disorders, and other complaints. There's also a subset of this condition where the stomach emptying is really slow. 
they have a syndrome we call gastroparesis. And that's much rarer, but that syndrome is really serious. And some of these people actually um, uh, do very poorly. So this is an important syndrome. And so the symptoms, the key symptoms that these people have are the symptoms shown on the slide. They can't finish a normal size meal. They have what's called early satiation, early satiety. Feel full, bloated, uncomfortable, particularly after they eat and they often have pain as well. And traditionally, this has been thought to be a stomach disorder. And indeed, there are markers of stomach dysfunction in people with this syndrome. The stomach can empty slowly. The stomach can fail to relax properly. The reason you're all feeling pleasantly satiated after breakfast assuming you're normal, the reason you're feeling that way is your gastric fundus, the stomach fundus, the top part of the stomach, has relaxed beautifully to accommodate the food you ate and you don't feel distressed. But if that fails, if that mechanism fails, then you will feel full, uncomfortable, bloated, can't finish the meal sometimes, you may even lose weight. And so that's the case. So we know that. But there's all sorts of other evidence, and here's some of it, and I'll show you some more in a moment, that suggests this is much more complex than some kind of gastric physiological change, which has been the traditional thinking now for the last 30 or 40 years. For example, work that we've done has shown that there is a clear association between these unexplained stomach symptoms and atopy and, you know, like asthma, diseases like asthma that are known to be atopic diseases. And we've confirmed this now in two very large studies. And also there's a small group of these people who seem to have an association with other autoimmune diseases, which is the first time anyone's actually linked those two groups together, a link between autoimmune and a link between unexplained gut symptoms, particularly in this case stomach symptoms, but also, as I'll come to, the irritable bowel syndrome. And in fact, if you look at the literature, including work that we've done, there's a host of risk factors that have been identified for these stomach symptoms. And here's a list of them. Female gender. Why are women more likely to develop these syndromes? Good question. The psychological dis dysfunction and sleep problems. Smoking. Smokers are more likely. Why are smokers more likely? If you've had antibiotics or after an acute infectious gastroenteritis, you're more likely. If you eat certain diets, if you have atopic disease and autoimmune disease, certain genes have been linked, I'll mention that later, etc. I'm going to try and tell you why all of these factors fit together in a disease model for this syndrome. Because that's the work that we've been doing. And how do we start? Well, we had a, a lucky break. But it was a lucky break based, based on, a, on an a priori hypothesis. Because once you recognise that there may be a link between atopic disease and a, gut, and a syndrome like unexplained gut symptoms, you begin to wonder, is it possible we've overlooked the kind of inflammation you see in atopic diseases, an eosinophilic inflammation? And so we looked in a population-based endoscopic study I did in Sweden. And what we did is we went to a northern town in Sweden and we invited people to come in for a free upper endoscopy. Free upper endoscopy. And we offered them a T-shirt to come in. <laughs> and we were flooded with people wanting to come. This was a random population sample. 80% came. 80, we were flooded. We scoped 1,000 people. And we thought very hard about the biological samples we would obtain and the deep phenotyping and the genotyping and other typing we would do 
in this study because it was unique and I didn't do it in Australia because I knew no one would come. <laughs> By the way, it was an unsedated upper endoscopy. That was the ethics, still had 80% come. We found what we hypothesized we would find. We found a distinct pathology in the duodenum that had been overlooked up to now. And that was an eosinophilic inflammation. There were also some mast cells in some of these cases, which I can come back to. But the point is, it was an eosinophilic inflammation. About 40% of those with unexplained stomach symptoms had this inflammation. It was always the group with early satiety and postprandial fullness. It was very characteristic. The eosinophils degranulated, and they degranulated next to the nerves, damaging them. And others have found this too, because I remember writing this paper and thinking no one's going to believe us. And in fact, one of the reviewers said, Swedes are strange. <laughs> I mean it. I still have it. <laughs> but they're not strange, actually. If you look around the world, and we've done work in the UK and Australia, but there's also other work from other groups around the world, particularly the European groups, they found it too. And in fact, if you look at this, and I won't take it, this is too much detail here, but you can actually demonstrate through very elegant nerve studies that the duodenal submucosal nerves are functionally abnormal, their calcium fluxes are abnormal, and they're structurally abnormal, they look abnormal. And that correlates strongly with the eosinophilic inflammation. We also look serologically. And our particular interest was in homing small intestinal T cells because we postulated that if you had an eosinophilic inflammation, you'd have an immune response if it was of any importance. And in fact, one of the potential measures of this was looking at what are called cytokines, these uh, potentially pro-inflammatory chemicals in the blood, and also CD4, alpha-4, or beta-7 uh, circulating lymphocytes that are linked and we know this from work in inflammatory bowel diseases, are linked to small intestinal inflammation. And indeed, that's what we found. We found that there is an increase in the circulating homing small bowel T cells, and they correlated with slow gastric emptying. In other words, we thought, based on these data, it was quite possible, although we still are working on this, quite possible that the slow emptying is related to the duodenal, the small intestinal inflammation. We also found that there was uh, an increase in cytokines, as you might expect, and indeed one of the key ones was TNF-alpha, which I'll come back to, but that also correlated with slow gastric emptying. And in some work that is uh, uh, currently uh, just about in press, we've presented this uh, at the major meetings, we've also shown that these people with this duodenal, this small intestinal inflammation, are at much higher risk of developing another common upper gut disease, gastroesophageal reflux. And that was really striking information that we believe is true and we have confirmed. So, the question is what's cause and effect, but it's fascinating data. It suggests there might be a new subset of people with reflux disease who are linked to a small intestinal uh, immune homeostasis disorder. And that's one of the working hypotheses we have as we uh, progress our work. And what's more, the people with this inflammation, inflammation's always bad. I mean, inflammation's always bad. But this is subtle inflammation. But even so, it's interesting that those people with this inflammation, they have a very significantly increased risk, a 500% increased risk of developing incident or what's called new onset anxiety. So these are people who were free of anxiety at baseline, no symptoms of psychological distress, but they were at risk of developing this over a follow-up time linked to small intestinal inflammation. So then the question is, what causes it? We have, we, have a, we have a pathway, 
potentially, and we've been working hard to dissect that pathway, which I haven't got time to talk about, but what could be the underlying causes? And we actually know some of these. For example, if you develop acute enteritis from a bacteria like Salmonella or Shigella or Campylobacter, you are at higher risk of developing an unexplained gut syndrome. And presumably you've got to be genetically primed, but this is the case. If you're a, tr if you're a soldier who deploys and you get gastroenteritis, and remember they're stressed individuals, they have a much higher risk of this. Look at these data. This is US data we just published this year. Bottom line is uh, these people have an extremely high attack rate of developing these chronic gut symptoms that don't go away after they come home. And we've also got some serological evidence of what might be going on here. We've been looking, uh, for example, at a particular uh, antibody to a uh, particular virulence factor, cytolethal distending toxin B. Name's not important, but the issue is there's a signature there that you can see in patients and in, and in subjects with these syndromes that suggests even though you may not remember you had a, an infectious disease that set off your process, you probably did, or you may have. Now, remember I mentioned smoking as a risk factor? A couple of big studies have said smoking's a risk factor for these unexplained stomach symptoms. And in fact, after an infectious outbreak, smoking is a risk factor for indeed developing, developing new onset uh, stomach symptoms. And in fact, smokers too have an increased duodenal eosinophilia. This is Australian data um, and uh, there's other data that supports this. So post-infectious, you can set off a cascade that can lead to these unexplained gut symptoms. At least that's one of the factors, although it's not the only one. Presumably it can't happen alone, there have to be other factors. There might be other infectious factors. We did a study in Sydney where we looked for risk factors and the only thing that came out for these stomach symptoms were herbivore pets, not carnivore pets. Cats and dogs, no problem. Rabbits, birds, horses, bad. And in fact, uh, what's so interesting about this is the parasite load in those animals is significant. And of course, parasites can induce an eosinophilic inflammation. Now, we, I've got to be honest, we haven't found parasites linked to the disease. We've looked really hard, but we do wonder if it's possible. But what about the bugs in the gut? Because they are critically important and they are perturbed if you develop an acute enteritis and they are perturbed by drugs and by diet and by other factors. And remember, we're only about, at best, half human. We are half human. In fact, if you look at the genes, we're 1% human. Isn't that great, the number of genes? But if you look at the cells, which is probably a better count, we're about 50-50, although if you have a bowel prep for your colonoscopy, you change the numbers in your favour for a minute or two, or maybe a day. <laughs> so we've been very interested in this. And what have we done? Well, we focused, of course, where the pathology is. Why would you go anywhere else? And there's been very little work on the small intestine. I mean, the biome of the small intestine, most of the biome work focuses on stool because you can get it easily. But it's a complex thing to deal with, as I'll mention a little bit later. But what we've done, and, and one of the problems too is getting biopsy samples that are, that are you know, not contaminated. So one of the first things we did was work on a device that actually would allow us to get uncontaminated specimens, which is what we're using. It's called the Brisbane Aseptic Biopsy Device because the work was done up in Brisbane. And but bottom line is this device has proven very useful because we can show, we can show by you know, looking at the bacterial community profiles, it's different if we brush versus if we do a standard biopsy versus if we use the aseptic device. And doing that, 
we've looked at the small intestinal bacteria. Now, this is some preliminary work that we published about two years ago showing a very clear difference in the bacteria that are present in the upper small intestine in those with these unexplained stomach symptoms versus those who were symptom-free controls. And what we showed in particular is there's an oral flora dominance in those with the stomach symptoms. They have a dominant oral flora and it's a different flora, uh, at least in some of the bacteria. For example, the streptococci, uh, certain species are clearly different. We've anaerobically cultured. Now that's been one of the most important things we've done because once we've got the bugs, we can look at the immune signatures to the bugs. And that's the current focus of the work we're doing which has been very exciting, which I can't tell you anything more about because it's IP'd at the moment. But, 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 it's exciting and fascinating and I think it's going to lead us somewhere with luck. The other thing is, like in other microbiome work, if you've got more bacteria, you've got more symptoms. And the way we measured symptoms is to give people a challenge meal, a standardised challenge meal, and measure the symptoms prospectively over a two-hour period. This is a very standardised approach that actually differentiates those with these symptoms versus controls. And more bacteria, lower quality of life. And we've done some other work too showing there's a link to gut homing markers for some of these bacteria, which has been very, very interesting and uh, indeed uh, um, uh, work that continues and uh, we're very excited about. I mentioned smoking and this inflammation. Smoking also changes the small intestinal microbiome. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, the genera and the species that come out from the analyses that we've been able to do, there is a clear differentiation and an exaggeration of some of the organisms that may well be linked to the syndrome. And then very interestingly, although this needs to be uh, confirmed, it's the only study that's looked at this, the people with slow gastric emptying also had a difference in their bacteria, one particular genus, Vianella. So one particular bug was linked to this. And it was actually a reduction in these bacteria and it didn't appear to be related to any, an alternative increase in others that we can find it seems to be directly linked to a reduction in this bacteria and indeed slower gastric emptying. This might mean, and this is a long way to go, this might mean if we modulate the bacteria in the small intestine, we can help people with diseases perhaps like gastroparesis, which is so serious, but that's a long way to go. And then in work that is currently unpublished, although we did the first gene work and really some of the first work in this uh, ever, um, showing that there were SNPs linked to functional dyspepsia. But we've also done new work suggesting that uh, in, in this syndrome, there is a, there is, there is a, a clear um, uh, genetic signature with the T-cell receptor alpha gene. There's actually four SNPs in that gene that are relevant. And work that we've done here uh, with the uh, um, MHC complex has shown us that indeed, indeed, there's an epistatic association between this set of SNPs and the MHC complex. What this really means in plain language is this might explain why you're set up to be atopic. And that could be very important, for not only gut diseases, but maybe others. So what about diet? Everybody's interested in diet. And one of the factors that has been of particular interest uh, in the lay press and elsewhere is wheat-induced symptoms. Now, there's another upper gut syndrome which actually is explained, and that's celiac disease, this gluten intolerance. You're genetically predisposed, you eat gluten, you get this adaptive T-cell mediated response and you get sick. And you not only get gut symptoms, in fact, you may only present with extra intestinal complaints. In fact, if you didn't know what caused this, you probably would combine these people into the unexplained gut syndromes. 
you would, because they've got very similar symptoms. Remarkably similar, if you look at it, you know, objectively. There are some other features you could argue are not, and we know a lot about celiac disease. But wheat is not just gluten. Wheat contains other proteins, like the uh, alpha-1 amylase inhibitors. It contains um, also uh, um, um, uh, fructose and, and other uh, fermentable carbohydrates that can also potentially interact in your gut to lead to symptoms. The reason I talk about this is celiac disease is relatively uncommon, about 1% of Australians. Wheat allergy is even rarer. This is typically for the alpha-1 amylase uh, uh, inhibitors, but other proteins in wheat as well, but it's pretty rare. But this epidemic of wheat intolerance, where you haven't got either wheat allergy or celiac disease, is a remarkable problem. In Australia, this is the most recent data we have, we haven't published it yet, it's going to be presented at the Digestive Diseases Week uh, coming up in a few months. Uh, nearly uh, one in four Australians, one in four, are avoiding wheat or gluten, at least some of it, not all of it. And, you know, about 4% are on a strict gluten-free diet. And these are people who do not have celiac disease. So it's pretty pretty prevalent. And why is it so? Why is it so? Because it's in the lay press and in the mind of many. Look at these wonderful books that are out there saying gluten-free, you'll be much, much better. You play better tennis even. It'll just be fantastic. And uh, if a movie star says so, clearly it's highly relevant. And so gluten has been vilified. Um, and, I think the, uh, and I think I'm going to try and explain to you for good reasons, we probably shouldn't do this, but, 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 there may be a subgroup where it's quite important in these unexplained stomach symptoms. By the way, we've done a little bit of work on the risks, on the benefits of a gluten-free diet, and the answer is, uh, if you're not celiac, celiac you benefit a lot. If you're not celiac, you don't benefit. Really, you don't, based on the data. In fact, you may even have a slightly higher risk of metabolic disease if you're on a gluten-free diet as an otherwise healthy individual. You may, and what's more, you're exposed to more arsenic. There's a beautiful study, not our work, a beautiful study from the United States showing increased arsenic levels in those who are on a gluten-free diet long term. So again, if you're celiac, you need to be on a gluten-free diet. It's really, really good for you. The benefits are un unequivocal. But if you're not celiac, the benefits are not necessarily there. But there's this big group of people who believe their symptoms are driven by wheat. Big group of people. So is this a real new disease that we've all been missing? Does this explain unexplained gut symptoms in some people? Well, if you look at the symptoms people report, it's remarkable, both gut symptoms and extra intestinal symptoms, including things like a foggy mind and various rashes and anxiety and uh, other features that uh, uh, also are seen in people with these otherwise unexplained gut symptoms too. So there's a bit of an overlap there, at least in terms of that. So we've been doing some work on this. This is work we've also presented at meetings, but it's as yet unpublished. But the bottom line is we've been looking to see if the immune system is activated more in people who are wheat sensitive, who self-report they are wheat sensitive, who appear to have genuine wheat sensitivity in terms of um, <clears throat> uh, when, they're, when they're looked at in terms of elimination diets, etc. And this is work that we're continuing to do and it's the kind of protocols that we have that I won't take you through. But if you look at the bottom line, those people who have unexplained gut symptoms, what's, you know, what are classified in the GI and the gut literature as a functional gut disorder like irritable bowel syndrome or functional dyspepsia, they're the two ones we studied. Those who actually say wheat induces symptoms, they've got a significantly increased level of immune activation in the small intestine. There's, a, there's evidence of a small intestinal inflammatory process. And one of the biomarkers we found are eosinophils. In fact, in celiac disease, I showed this a long time ago. And I've, read, I've gone back to this paper and thought, hmm, interesting. 
Eosinophils are a biomarker of celiac disease, well described, and they degranulate. But now there's evidence from us and others that there's also eosinophils in these non-celiac wheat sensitive individuals in a subset. Not everybody, not everybody. This is clearly a subset. So just like we've seen in the unexplained stomach symptom group, we see it in the people who say wheat can drive my symptoms. And they've got a very specific duodenal biome. Some of them anyway. So we think, we think, and we're doing work on this. This is again uh, work in, in progress. We think this is going to yield great fruit. So we've got a model for this that we think is important. You've got to partially digest the wheat. You've got to release the protein so you have the epitopes there to interact with the mucosa. And the bugs do this. The right bugs, we think, do this. At least that's the hypothesis. And then the immune system can be activated. And once the immune system activates, then you drive a process that at least in a subset of these people, and again, how big this subset is, I think it's going to be a minority, but it's still important. It drives potentially the symptom process, which I'll show you in a moment. Interestingly, there's recent work, this is not our work, this is work from Italy, suggesting not only does the small intestine get an, a an eosinophilia, but in the rectum, you can also identify a subtle eosinophilia. That remains to be confirmed. We haven't been biopsying the rectum. So we've got this list of risk factors, but it all fits with the immune homeostasis going awry in people with these unexplained stomach symptoms. And the female gender fits the immune activation story. There are many other diseases of immune activation that are female predominant. The cytokine responses that I'll show you in a few minutes could well be one of the drivers of things like anxiety, at least we believe so, or at least we believe it's, it's feasible. And some of the other changes that we see fit, although the autoimmune process probably is a separate subset, and we're doing work looking at this autoimmune process, uh, looking at some of the changes that can occur after infection, like the release or, or presence of vinculin in the biopsies that may be relevant. So we have this nice model that we think fits fairly well. And what's more, it's not only the gut symptoms that are driven here. It's at least in our view quite feasible the extra intestinal complaints, the whole syndrome, all of the features that have been unexplained could tie in at least in a subset of people with uh, this immune activation syndrome, this immune homeostasis disease characterised in some cases by duodenal eosinophilia. And in my last little bit, I want to talk about irritable bowel syndrome for those who may have an interest, because I focus more on the upper gut, but we've also been working in the lower gut. And, you know, I think it's fair to say this is also a distressing, costly, unexplained disorder. And the problem with IBS is, quite frankly, it's probably 20 diseases, not one. However, there are subsets. So one of our uh, very interesting ideas was uh, to look at the sodium channel genes um, that are linked to Brugada syndrome. Why did we do that? because it wasn't shown on the, the GWASs didn't come up with this. Why did we look at this? Because actually we had patients with Brugada syndrome who had unexplained gut symptoms and we couldn't work out why. And Brugada syndrome is this long QT syndrome, which is actually um, 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 a little bit of a different disease because the gene, the, 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 the mutation that we identified is part of the complex but actually doesn't predispose you to the sudden death syndrome that is Brugada. But that was exciting because that explains it. We've looked at the microbiome. There's lots of work in the, in, the, in the colon, particularly in stool, but also some work in the mucosal associated microbiome of the colon. And all I can tell you is our work doesn't show a signature. We have done 16S, we have done um, 
um, uh, metagenomics, we, 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 we have looked very hard. So we don't find a signal. But we did find this. So this is, these are colonic biopsies, and you see that black line in figure C with those what look like bacteria maybe just above it, uh, and in fact they're all bacteria, that whole black line, a dense bacteria lining the sigmoid colon. And these are spirochetes. Now we've known about these for nearly 100 years. They are large, weakly gram-negative spiral organisms, anaerobic bacteria, which are seen in animals and occasionally in humans. At least that's what the literature said. The literature also said these are commensals. These are irrelevant bugs. We shouldn't even bother studying them. And uh, interestingly, on 16S, you almost never see them. So this is when you do the microbiome, the genetics work, to find what's going on. But what's been interesting here is, um, in fact, these things uh, look much more pathogenic when you look at them. We actually discovered these in another Swedish population-based study where we invited a, a cohort to come in for a, a, a random cohort for a free colonoscopy. Yeah, they did. And they came in. They came in. They did. So we discovered these. And uh, I remember, I remember we, we, we had started staining the biopsies, a bit like Robin Warren, interestingly. We started staining them with things like Worth and Starry stain. And then we saw this and thought, my goodness. And you can see them on H&E, but still. And the thing is, these bugs do not look like commensals. They just don't look like that. They can actually potentially invade the mucosa. They can actually align with the mucosa um, and burrow in in some cases. Um, and look at that one over there. Um, and basically, uh, you don't tend to see that with commensals in at least our experience. And in fact, this looks like what I've called the helicobacter of the colon. These are not helicobacter, and that's a very, probably a very silly thing to say, but, but it's fascinating. And they're associated with a very specific pathology that no one else had reported. So we found you get, again, a colonic eosinophilia. It's very subtle, but it's clearly there, and we've verified this in two large studies, and you get increased mast cells as well that's thought to be relevant. Um, if you look at uh, the 16S, I'm not going to take you through this. This is data that we've just finished. Bottom line is the primers miss it. You don't find it until you use the right primers. And we've done some sequencing. So we've got a bug, and it's linked not only to pathology, but it's linked to irritable bowel syndrome. It doesn't explain a large number in our hands, although there's work from Sweden which has found much larger associations than we have. But the bottom line is it seems to be linked to IBS. And then finally, I want to mention, there's immune activation in IBS too. This is work, again, with the TNF alpha, and it's linked. Not only do you find these chemicals circulating, but you also see a, a correlation which doesn't prove it's causal, but a correlation with anxiety. And so what we've done is we've looked not at IBS, but at Crohn's disease patients, and we've looked to see whether if you block TNF, you change the brain, you change features that might suggest they're at risk of depression, and if you change whether, if you give them a nutrient stimulus, their symptoms are less when they're TNF alpha blocked. And the summary is yes, yes, and yes. TNF alpha blockade changes gut function, at least indirectly, changes brain function directly and indirectly. In other words, this might be a way forward. And we've done other work which suggests there's, you know, like two groups of patients subjects, people, with these unexplained gut symptoms. The people who may have things that begin centrally, a brain-gut syndrome. But there's another large group who appear to have a true gut-to-brain set of pathways that are relevant. We're currently trying to work out the biochemistry in the brain that may be relevant to that brain-gut group. So finally, in my last minute or so, um, 
why do this work? What's the relevance to human health? Well, we've had no tests for these unexplained gut syndromes. We now potentially do. We invasively investigate people with unexplained chronic disabling gut symptoms because we have to to find out if they've got other diseases that might explain them. If we have tests, we might be able to avoid that. The cost, the inconvenience, the risk. And then, of course, treatments may be possible that not just control symptoms, but cure disease. And maybe not just gut disease, maybe also diseases like anxiety, at least in subsets. So we've done some work on this. Um, for example, we're able to show, this is proof of principle work, that if you combine genetic markers with inflammatory markers, you can diagnose unexplained gut syndromes, IBS, without taking the history. It's not perfect, but it's a proof of principle. We've actually patented all of this. In terms of treatment, we've identified that if you give proton pump inhibitors, they're anti-inflammatory, like a meprazole. And indeed, this has now been confirmed in work from Leuven, and there's a lovely mechanism around eataxin 3 uh, um, uh, block a, or IL-13 blockade uh, that uh, is relevant. And then we're looking at pathways. So there's inflammation, there's histamine release, and if you block histamine, you will potentially lead to symptom resolution, at least in our hands. And what's more, uh, this is related to the duodenal eosinophilia load in these patients. So I guess there's a paradigm shift, at least in our minds. We've gone from self-reported symptoms, do a workup, give them some drugs, hope for the best, they get a little bit better, everybody's miserable, to a personalized potential, potential, personalised treatment approach which needs a lot more work but at least the lead suggests and all of the evidence I've seen, not only by our group but by other leading groups in the world, all suggests we're going to be able to do this and that's why it's so exciting. So thank you very much. By the way, this work is of course uh, very much a group activity um, and not just my colleagues in Newcastle and, and in, at the University of Queensland where we work very closely, but also groups around the world that I've had the, the great privilege to collaborate with. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, and I think you'll agree it's been a great privilege to uh, hear such a uh, tour de force presentation on a very complex part of the body, or in fact, almost the whole body. I'm sure you mentioned almost everything except the feet. So we will open the, uh, the next 10, 10 or so minutes up for questions. Yes, could you please identify yourself and ask a very short question? Thank you. So this is a question about Alzheimer's disease, which I do not work in Alzheimer's, so I need to be very clear. That, um, and and uh, the changes in the oral mucosa potentially leading to, and, and gut changes potentially leading to brain changes. So look, all I can say is we've become very interested in neurodegenerative diseases and the gut recently because we, we are beginning to wonder if some of these inflammatory and, 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 and other pathways could be relevant. There's fascinating research out there. It's a little bit, I would argue, still very early days in terms of causality. And I think that's one of the big issues with a lot of the work that's been going on, particularly in what's called the microbiome. Um, it's very much associations, lots of associations, but is it really cause and effect? And it's, it's critical to dissect that out. And we recognise that limitation with our own work as well. So there's a lot to do. But it's not inconceivable. <laughs> and Parkinson's is an even better example, I think. Not inconceivable 
that there is a gut-driven process. And in Parkinson's, there's a wonderful hypothesis about this where, you know, it, basically you get travel up the vagal nerve pathways to the brain and the alpha-synuclein changes that we know are markers for that disease. So I don't work in Alzheimer's, but the bottom line is I think more... Uh, more interest in this is inevitable. There'll be a huge surge of interest amongst the neurodegenerative research groups in gut-related neurodegenerative disease processes. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for your fascinating presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, why do you think there was so much resistance by the scientific and medical community about uh, the specific bacteria being responsible when for at least 100 years we've known the widespread effects of bacteria? Is it something that's just innate in the stubborn human nature or...? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think it's fair to say, and we've got to be careful. I mean, lo there's lots of crackpot ideas and, 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 and crackpot research that's done. I mean, you know, it's not done deliberately, but they're just not reprodu it's not reproducible science. One of the things we've always tried to do in my group is we reproduce our own work. You know, if we can't reproduce what we what we what we want to find, then we're we're not right. So so and obviously we want others to reproduce it too. So then we're really convinced. So that's one of the issues, and I think it's true too that if you have a certain disease model that you've grown up with or become attached to or you developed, like the model I've shown you that we developed. Well, you kind of like your model and you don't really want disparate information to drive a change. I think that is a little bit of human nature. What we've tried to do is we've tried to say, well, there's all this disparate information which appears reproducible because others have, you know, it's been more than one group have shown this. Well, it must fit together. It can't be, it, it must fit together in a disease model, but it can't be the current one. And that's partly how we've progressed our thinking doesn't mean it's the right way only. Um, I also think it's fair to say when Barry came up with a bug for peptic ulcer, no one had ever shown a chronic human disease, you know, was linked to a bug like this that appeared to be a stress-related disorder or an acid-related disorder. No one had thought about that. Um, of course, it turned out to be perfectly correct. And when you looked back at all the disparate data in the literature prior to that discovery, it then all made sense in the disease model. That's what was so interesting and was a great lesson for me. There's one down front. One here, down there. Any on this side? Hi, Nick. Fantastic presentation. We spoke earlier and mad researcher myself. Really curious about um, about dietary or nutritional interventions other than wheat that have had positive results or negative results. Um, you talked a bit about um, the TNF, alpha blocker. What, are there any dietary or nutritional research in that area as well as anti-inflammatory? Yeah. So, so, so diet, I, I'm not a dietitian and I'm not, a, you know, I, we're, we're doing work in dietary factors because the, the, the syndromes we study clearly are linked to dietary, you know, intake. It's clear that you, you eat things and you get symptoms. So, so it's it's clearly critically important. Um, there's there's a but there's a huge amount of work to be done. So prebiotics, you know, I mean, what what's a good diet that's going to drive a, a ne, you know a, an anti-inflammatory diet? Is that going to work in these syndromes? I don't know. If you reduce fermentable carbohydrates, the low FODMAP diet craze, that helps people with IBS. It doesn't cure it, but it helps their symptoms, presumably because the fermentation by the bacteria and the gas release is reduced if you take out the fermentable carbohydrates. That's a great advance. It doesn't cure the disease, but it certainly is helpful clinically, and we're doing that routinely with patients who will tolerate that sort of dietary approach, following the Monash uh, you know, group's uh, excellent work, really excellent work. But to be honest, there is so much we do not know. We are currently collecting dietary data all over the place and we're looking at correlations. The trouble is that doesn't prove cause and effect. 
So we've got these difficulties. And how do you define if you're truly sensitive to a specific food substance? You've got to do a double-blind withdrawal dietary approach and then challenge. And even if you challenge and they're positive, some of it's by chance because things happen by chance. So very difficult. And what we're thinking is we'll go back to mechanisms. We'll try to find where the bacteria and, for example, wheat proteins interact and see where that takes us. But we can't cover everything and there's a field that is just waiting to be, uh, to be studied. By the way, when you change your diet, within a few weeks to months, you change your microbiome, for better or for worse. That's definitely the, definitely the data. Thanks for the talk. It's Michelle Vanette. I wanted to ask what you're suggesting to patients to do once you diagnose these symptoms. <laughs> Well, uh, the first thing is to make the correct diagnosis. I think in medicine that, that remains critical. And th the problem is with some of these vague symptoms, there can be many different possible, sometimes unusual causes that you need to think about. So it does require a medical assessment, at least in my view, um, to, to be sure you've got the right label. And, and for example, we still see people with missed celiac disease and other things that will come along sometimes. So, so there's clearly, and, and in fact, there's a very interesting subset of these people who are, who are genetically predisposed to potentially celiac, that's 40% of the population, but they also have um, changes on the biopsy that even though they haven't got celiac, they've actually got you know some markers of celiac. So there may be a bit of a spectrum here as well, but that, that's another story. Bottom line is it needs to be assessed properly, but these syndromes you know can be recognised clinically, um, and then treatment. If you look at the guidelines, are very much symptom directed therapies, um, and I think it is worth considering other approaches. We're, and so we're running randomised trials to see whether we can confirm some of our important initial observations. And uh, um, uh, they will continue and hopefully, we hope, if they're positive, change practice. But we're not there yet. Okay, two more questions. There's one here and one up there. Um, uh, thank, thanks very much. Uh, Who's here? Oh, yeah. Doesn't seem to, oh, there we go. Uh, thanks for a very good talk. Um, could I just ask a question in two parts? Um, could you comment on lactose tolerance? Because I think that's a relatively recent evolutionary phenomenon. And uh, any relationship between that and f f on the other dietary fad, which is f fermented foods? <laughs> um, uh, uh, lactose, I can answer. Fermented foods, I, I know less about. And, um, and I, I don't know whether that's a positive thing or not. So I, that's my comment. Um, in terms of lactose intolerance, we know um, that there is a subgroup of people who clearly, when they ingest milk or milk products, um, will develop symptoms because they're lactase deficient. And, you know, there, there's some ethnic groups that are particularly high, high rates and uh, uh, other groups that are much lower rates. Um, we, the, while, while lactose intolerance is an important syndrome, it, it, it actually is not a, a huge piece of this unexplained symptom group, partly because we can diagnose it and partly because you've got to have a lactose load that's sufficient to induce symptoms. And most people don't drink enough milk <laughs> or have enough, have enough of a load to actually get symptoms after they ingest it. So that's interesting. So it's not just about being lactase enzyme deficient, you've, got to have enough, you've actually got to drink enough lactose to get the symptoms. It's an easy thing to diagnose with a breath test or a biopsy, so, and it's well recognised in practice. And in fact, lactose-related products are, are removed from the low, in the low FODMAP diet, that is, that's part of what's taken out. So anyway. Last question. Yep. Uh, thanks very much, Mike Zimmerman from uh, Main Sequence Ventures, the CSRO's venture fund. Um, you talked about the, the microbiome work that's going on. I'm just wondering if you could kind of paint a picture, picture for us in the future, if you could imagine um, your research is progressing, the rest of the sector's research is progressing. How will we, um, how will we be diagnosing issues and, and how will this kind of manifest in a day-to-day -day clinical sense? Do you see, because there, there are these companies that are doing microbiome 
profiling, there's smart pills that detect gases, things like that. How do you see it actually manifesting in practice? Well, that's a huge question. So we're doing a little work on gas sensing and, uh, you know, little probes that go down and, and do this. Very interesting. In fact, I'm having a meeting tomorrow about that. Um, and that may be one way. The problem with the company sequencing now is they don't get the same answer and others don't get the same answer um, when, when, the, when the same specimens are tested. There's a, real, there's a real methodological set of issues here in terms of how you do it, how you get the specimens, how you store the specimens, how you test the specimens, etc. Rob Knight's written, uh, who's one of, the, you know, one of the, the Human Genome Project guru in, in San Diego, has written about this recently, uh, and it's uh, well worthwhile reading. It b but basically argues that you've really got to be cautious about what we're doing. And of course, we've got a long way to go to get right down to the species, the actual bacteria that really do something. We keep talking about groups of bacteria. I'm old fashioned. I think we're going to find pathogens in there somewhere. And so our work, rather than focusing on just what goes up, what goes down, load, uh, related to various features, correlations, associations, our work is looking for mechanisms and for pathogens, for, for bugs that actually drive immune response, that then can potentially drive disease that we recognise clinically. So I'm a bit of a maverick because other the ecologists would argue very differently to me. If you had one of the microbiome ecologists up here, like Rob, he would say something a little bit different and might disagree. But that's fun in science. Okay, great, great note to end on. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, we have a present. I'm not sure what the book is, but uh, <laughs> feels like a book. And this will be uh, very good for your gut microbiome, some, some <laughs> alcohol, which was barely mentioned today. Too important. So <laughs> please join me in thanking Nick for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we finished on time, which is great. The next seminar is on the 30th of April. It'll be Professor Mike uh, Biesuk from the University of Sydney, who's a founder of the company Q Control and uh, from the uh, School of Physics at the University of Sydney. And he will be talking about building the quantum economy. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.